No matter what anyone says, rock on. Keith wrote the basics of satisfaction. He says in Clearwater, Florida, you know, at night time he woke up with that, uh, with the, the idea of satisfaction. Can't get no da 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 satisfaction. And then it became this classic fucking track, you know. Whenever he put satisfaction, he was going mad, mad, mad. He was telling that Mick and Keith were writing shit and he couldn't stand the music they were doing. I thought it was really funny. Never, I never listened to one album of the Rolling Stones in Brian's place. Never. You know, Brian was completely fan of the Beatles. I think he liked drinking. I think he liked drugs. But they weren't very good for him. Uh, I don't think they're good for anyone. But he didn't have. He wasn't strong enough to, mentally or physically to take any of it. And of course, he did. He did everything. Brian was one of those people that did everything to excess. Because he was drinking from the morning to the last uh, minute in the night. He was drinking Scotch Coke. Coke Scotch. All day, all night, all the time. You know. I guess he was a little jealous of Mick because he was he had all the fame sort of thing. But I don't think Brian realised that he, he he had just as much too. I think he would have liked to have been like Mick, but then no one's like Mick. He has this charisma about him. He has this amazing energy. I understand Brian because I think he was a lost person. Say hi to Brian. Brian is one of the writers of most of the things, right? No, I'm not actually. Well, I'm not really a writer. Uh, we do write a lot of stuff together. It comes out under the Nankafel pseudonym, but Mick and Keith write more than any of us. Brian tormented himself because he couldn't write songs like Mick and Keith, whose compositions had moved the band on to a whole new level. Brian Jones, the elusive architect behind the Rolling Stones, locked in a fierce battle with Mick Jagger, the charismatic frontman whose voice was a loaded weapon ready to fire. The battleground? Not just the stage, but the sacred realm of songcraft. Writing the songs that you write, do you sometimes think that you have a special inspiration for the way that you... Well, you better ask about writing songs. You know, better ask, address those questions to Mick and Keith, because they'll tell you more about it. All right. The ones that we've written together are just things that we've worked out together in the studio. With somebody, you know, anyone has had an idea. If you had to do all over again, do you think you'd go the same route again as far as, you know, now that you realize the demands that are put on you as a tremendous success? I'd do it a hundred times over if I could. I love it. Good. Thank you so much. Brian endowed with a myriad of musical gifts and an insatiable artistic soul, yearned to become the poetic heart of the stones. He envisioned their sound cloaked in exotic tapestries, woven from the strings of sitars and the hushed whispers of mellotrons. And talk to Keith and to, to Mick. Oh, yeah. These are the two that are supposed to be all the, uh, the writing talent. You fellows get together and do most of the writing, right? Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. There's a lot of it, you know, some of it. Do you have a particular inspiration for some of your songs that uh, seem to springboard them out? Uh, well, I don't, I don't know. Ask Keith. I, I, I don't really, really think so. No, it just, just happened. It just happened. See, the trouble was, by 1963, when Mick and Keith were writing the songs and all that, Andrew was trying to promote Keith and kind of dismiss Brian, get Brian out of the way. And so what he did was he stopped me, Charlie and Brian, from doing any interviews with any of the newspapers, any interviews at all, and gave them all to Mick and Keith. Mick uh, ruled the roost as far as what they were going to play and 
the fact that he could write music and Brian couldn't. I think there, there may have been a little jealousy there, the fact that, that uh, Mick and Keith were so close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel all right. I think they were a little bit lost until Andrew came along and then Andrew kind of laid down the law and said what he wanted to do, uh, which was all very well. And I thought that was a good idea to have a manager, but I don't think Brian realised that he would be handing everything over to him. They had two different ideas of what they wanted to do. Brian loved Howling Wolf and he wanted to stay as a blue group. Andrew wants them to be pop. I think Andrew and Brian just didn't didn't hit it off. And I think they just got into loggerhead. It pop sold. And obviously Andrew wanted to make money. They were all a little um, weary of, I think, of Brian, because he could be kind of moody. But they, I think they put that on him because he was supposed to be the leader and he was no longer the leader. Dear Melinda, Mick is the head of the group. At one time I was, but Mick took over. Don't ask me why. A psychedelic symphony far removed from the bluesy thunder craved by Mick. His lyrics, fragments of poetry reflecting his inner turmoil, were penned, yet they lacked the visceral punch, the streetwise swagger effortlessly wielded by Jagger. Jagger, with his magnetic growl and a devil-may-care demeanor, was a born showman. He wrote with an inkwell brimming with sweat and desire, spewing anthems of rebellion and youthful unrest that struck a chord with a generation hungry for change. Jumpin' Jack Flash and Satisfaction, I Can't Get No, were Jagger's sonic grenades exploding with raw energy, leaving Brian's introspective verses overshadowed like wildflowers crushed beneath the boots of a rock god. The tension simmered beneath the surface. <laughs> We were in Clearwater, Florida. Me and Brian picked up these two girls in the in the cocktail bar. We were cute, two cute girls. We went to bed with them. Strange things was the very same night. Keith wrote the basics of satisfaction. He says in Clearwater, Florida, you know, at night time he woke up with that uh, with the, the idea of satisfaction. Can't get no da 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 satisfaction. And when he woke up in the morning and listened to it and all that, him and Mick thought it was a, a pretty okay song for an album. And then it became this classic fucking track, you know. They're going da 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 and I'm going ding ding da 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 So Brian just played the walking rhythm behind him and it kind of worked. Nick and Keith are wonderful songwriters. I mean, they're just great. Extraordinary. I mean, I, I couldn't admire them more. They tended to write more about sex, so from 64, 84, like for 20 years, they were just turning them out. I mean, they're classic rock and roll songs. I'd rate it as uh, extraordinary. Brian, plagued by insecurity and sensitivity, felt his creative voice drowned by the Jagger juggernaut. His bandmates gravitated toward Mick's songwriting prowess their admiration translating into musical choices that marginalized him. Frustration gnawed at him, poisoning his spirit and seeping into his performances. Whenever he put satisfaction, he was going mad, mad, mad. He was telling that Mick and Keith were writing shit and he couldn't stand the music they were doing. 
He said, it's not the music I wanted to do. You know, I made a group to do some uh, uh, blues and uh, rock and roll and, uh, you know, and uh, he said, look at this, it's vulgar, it's awful, it's uh, out of tune, it's nothing. Once a guitarist painting a kaleidoscope of sonic hues, Brian's playing became erratic, tinged with a melancholic edge. He retreated into the shadows of the stage, his enigmatic soul further eclipsed by Jagger's flamboyant theatrics. The public witnessed a brooding musician, lost in his own world, oblivious to the creative storm within. He was doing so many stupid things all the time, and I was also taking the same shit with him, you know, speed. And we didn't sleep for days and days and days. And once a week we were sleeping one night. And then again and again and again clubs and everything, you know, you know all night long, all day long. He was playing guitar at home. But he was not really composing because I think he was not sure of himself. He wasn't sure that he was right. He wasn't sure that uh, what he was uh, doing was good. Uh, and he had nobody around to tell him to go on, you know, to do it. I think he was not so happy. I think he was so, sort of sad. And I think also that when he was crying at night and that all those things were, you know, only symptoms. He was worried of so many people you know, looking at him and, you know, Brian was much more happy when he was alone. As for Brian Jones, the Rolling Stone with celestial wings, he continues to soar within the hearts of fans. Brian was really nervous that night because he's walking in on a Beatles session. And I kind of thought he'd bring a guitar, you know, but no, he brought his saxophone. He was nervous to the point of sort of shaking a little bit. I mean, he was like a ropey sax player. So I thought, aha, we've got just the tune. It was very nice. You know, Brian was a very nice guy. I remember sort of laughing a lot with him, you know, giggling a lot. I thought it was really funny. Never, I never listened to one album of the Rolling Stones in Brian's place. Never. You know, Brian was completely fan of the Beatles. I mean, all day long we were listening to the Beatles, or the Righteous Brothers, but never, never, never the Rolling Stones. You know we were going back from John's house in his big chauffeur-driven car where he had a, uh, a loudspeaker mounted underneath the car and a microphone inside the car. And ahead of us was Brian's Austin Princess. John got on the mic. Pull over now, you are under arrest. Brian Jones, pull over now. Oh, <laughs> shooting himself, you know. Oh, oh, holy shit. <laughs> Brian was very nice guy. He was very nervous. Had always had a sort of pleasant word. Brian wasn't a silent victim. He fought back through his music, a silent scream of defiance. He experimented with dissonance, eastern scales and sounds pushing the boundaries of rock and roll. The only person of the group who came to visit him was Bill. I never, never, never see Mick or Keith coming to visit him. Never, never, never. Paint It Black and Child of the Moon emerged as his masterpieces, sonic landscapes painted with the brushstrokes of his anguish. You mentioned that he did something with Jimi Hendrix. Um, yes. Some, some playing. Yeah. <laughs> no one knows that. <laughs> what do I say? Brian Jones, the elusive visionary behind the Rolling Stones, embodied a tapestry of contradictions. A musical pioneer with an unquiet soul, 
He possessed a gaze that spoke of ancient mysteries and a smile capable of charming birds from their perches. And I got Brian trying to write a song with that guy, Michael Aldred, of Ready, Steady, Go. Um, but they're unique things that I've just happened to got, and, um, but um, he never had the courage to record it. Oh, fuck it, I'll turn it off. So far away, like an angel, drifting through the piles of stars alone. I read all her likes and dislikes, her story of success. He never played me a song he'd written. So it was quite hard to know what really if he wanted to do songs with with us. He'd written, I think he did, but he was very shy and all that. And I think he found it rather hard to lay it down to us, you know, that this was a song and it went like this. And we probably sort of didn't even think because he didn't do it, we weren't didn't try and bring it out of him probably, which is I suppose a bit insensitive of us. I think he liked drinking, I think he liked drugs, but they weren't very good for him. Uh, I don't think they're good for anyone, but he didn't have, he wasn't strong enough to, mentally or physically to take any of it, and of course he did, he did everything. Brian was one of those people that did everything to excess. Yet beneath the celestial dust of stardom, a sinister shadow lurked, an insatiable thirst that gnawed at his core, relentlessly seeking solace within the amber embrace of alcohol. <laughs> that I was telling Brian, you're only 24 years old, you're not going to start now, you know. It's ridiculous, you should just drink a little bit less, you know. His liaison with the bottle commenced inconspicuously. A casual toast, evolving into an evening companion, then a morning crutch. The pressures of notoriety, the tornado of relentless tours, and the internal discord within the band momentarily found refuge in the depths of a glass. Whiskey, scotch, anything with a bite. Because he was drinking from the morning to the last uh, minute in the night, he was drinking scotch coke. Coke scotch. All day, all night, all the time. You know. It dulled anxieties stoked the flames of creativity, and cast the world in a beguiling, hazy hue. He was never drunk, because with the speed, you know, it didn't make him drunk, but he was yeah, really doing every stupid things you can imagine. I see a as I want it into black. His early compositions mirrored this uneasy ballet, the dreamy sitar in painted black. Or in the darkest night, no one knows. And the haunting melody of Ruby to his day held a melancholic beauty, reflecting the shadows dwelling within. I always felt very sorry for Brian. He was two things. He was not very nice, and he upset people very easily. He wasn't very pleasant, I mean. As the stones ascended to the pinnacle of Rock's pantheon, Brian's descent into alcoholism accelerated. Missed recording sessions, erratic behavior, a widening chasm between him and the band. The trouble with Brian was he wasn't very well a lot of the time, he, 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 so he was often ill. He'd be on tour and he'd get sick, and he'd be in hospital for five days and we had to play without him. Just the four of us, you know. Bass, drum, guitar. And you're playing all them songs that need more than one guitar, and you've only got one guitar. So I had to double up on bass, the bass playing and help Keith out, you know, and Keith had to play a bit more than he would normally play, playing partly rhythm, partly lead. It was tough, you know. Friends and lovers observed with mounting alarm, their pleas and interventions drowned in the thunderous roar of the bottle. The music underwent a transformation as well. So he was very unreliable at times in the later period of his life, you know, the last maybe the three years. Brian used to get very paranoid about being made fun of. You know, um, he always says they're talking about me in there, and you know, when we're waiting in the 
and that when we were staying over in a hotel or something. Introspective melodies gave way to a bluesy abyss, a howl of anguish echoing Brian's internal strife. Oh, everybody went through their a star trip, you know, and uh, I think Brian was the only one that, that it changed in a really deep way and probably not for the better. It was very difficult for him, you know, and not made any easier probably by the rest of us, you know, because nobody had the time to look after somebody else. If one of them isn't quite strong enough to, to deal with that situation, there's very little you can do to help him. Tracks like Under My Thumb and Child of the Moon evolved into sonic landscapes of his struggle, raw and brutally honest. Under my thumb, the girl. Yet, even amid the darkness, glimmers of brilliance persisted. His mastery of instruments, his unorthodox arrangements, continued to push the boundaries of rock. Reluctantly, he became a muse, inspiring his bandmates while gradually succumbing to the fumes of self-destruction. But within a very short amount of time, another guy was coming out. Uh, a Mimi. <laughs> you know, started and uh, somebody you didn't suspect lurked in there. And this guy got bigger and bigger as the years went by and also became more self-destructive. Now, like, I'm one to talk about that, right? But I'm still here. Brian Jones' tale transcends a mere rivalry. It's a saga of the human toll exacted by creative ambition. A narrative of dreams drowning in whiskey, of potential strangled by insecurities. It serves as a poignant reminder that even in the electrifying realm of rock and roll, shadows persist, and the brightest lights can cast the darkest scars. Under my yeah, all right. To be a pop star, I enjoy it. Uh with reservations, but um, I'm not really sort of satisfied either artistically or personally. You know, when I think about it, Brian, when we were slogging away with no recognition, just doing what we're doing, you know, and, and quite enjoying it, but um, with no great uh, ambitions or anything, he was a great guy. Let's face it. The future as a rolling stone is very uncertain. Brian Jones, the maestro who couldn't compose the symphony, might not have authored the chart toppers, but his story echoes hauntingly. A ballad of untapped talent, of whispered regrets, and the bittersweet beauty of a soul forever lost in the reverberations of what could have been. Thanks for tuning in and hanging out with us. Don't miss the next episode. Until then, keep it rolling. He don't know if it's right or wrong. Maybe he should tell someone. He's not sure just what it was. Or if it's against the law. Something.